Welcome, everybody. Good evening. Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to Skeptical Inquirer Presents. This is our series of live online presentations from experts who are devoted to advancing science over pseudoscience, media literacy over conspiracy theories, and critical thinking over magical thinking. My name is Paul Fidalgo. I am the editor of a different magazine, Free Inquiry magazine, you may have heard of, freeinquiry.net, uh, and I will be your host for this evening. As per our tradition here on Skeptical Inquirer Presents, if you've ever seen us before, you know that we like to start uh, by letting you know about whatever uh, notable calendar date uh, of observance there that today might be. And so today is uh, March 2nd. I always have trouble choosing these, but uh, March 2nd is uh, International Rescue Cat Day. So I admit I was a little disappointed. Uh, it's not a day meant to honor cats who swoop in and rescue people like superheroes. It is for the adoption of cats who need homes. I'm allergic to cats, but I will cheer this one on from the sidelines and you know hope a rescue cat will come and save me. Um, it's also the 119th birthday of the late Dr. Seuss and the 61st birthday of John Bon Jovi. Uh, both of them are wanted, dead or alive. I'm sorry, that was terrible. Um, it is also National Read Across America Day, and so what better way to celebrate the reading of books than to watch a video on your computer, right? Perfect. Anyway, uh, let me tell you a quickly a few things that are going on here at the Center for Inquiry. Uh, Skeptical Inquirer Presents comes to you from the folks who publish Skeptical Inquirer magazine. I have not yet gotten the latest issue in my mailbox yet, uh, but you definitely want to check it out. It just hit newsstands, and the cover is honoring the uh, late editor of Skeptical Inquirer, Kendrick Frazier. I have a piece in there, so I do hope you'll look at that at skepticalinquirer.org. And uh, you can subscribe at skepticalinquirer.org, and of course, our magazine, Free Inquiry at freeinquiry.net. Okay, enough of that. Here is what happens now. You, the audience, you're all set. You're good. You just sit back and enjoy tonight's presentation. You're going to become a smarter, better person as a result. Just watch. Um, if you have questions while the presentation is going on, you just pop them in the little chat box there. And if we have time at the end of today's presentation, we'll see if we can get some of those answered. We probably can't get to everybody's, but we'll do our best. Now, let's talk about our special guest for today. Today's presentation comes from Dr. Joe Schwartz. He is simply one of the most respected and beloved science communicators of our time. He is director of McGill University's Office for Science and Society, well known for his informative and entertaining public lectures on topics ranging from the chemistry of food to the connection between the body and the mind. Professor Schwartz is also the author of several best-selling books, including a Grain of Salt, The Science and Pseudoscience of What We Eat, Monkeys, Myths, and Molecules, A Feast of Science, and many, many more. Uh, he's a frequently sought-out guest in the media, bringing his science expertise to outlets such as the Discovery Channel, CTV, CBC, TV Ontario, and more. In 2015, we awarded him the Ballas Prize in Critical Thinking for his book, Is That a Fact?, uh, he is the host of the radio show and podcast, The Dr. Joe Show. Oh, and of course, he is a fellow of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. Now, his latest book, which I have right here, we get that in the camera there, the best title of any book ever, Quack, Quack, The Threat of Pseudoscience, uh, which I absolutely loved. We were just talking about this before we started. Um and um, unfortunately, not really about ducks. Ducks are included in the book, not a book about ducks, but it's way more relevant than that, uh, unless you're really into ducks. Uh, he focuses on the deluge of anecdotes, cherry-picked data, pseudoscientific nonsense, and seductive yet baseless health claims that are undermining efforts to educate the public about evidence-based science. But you don't need to hear about it from me, because the man himself is here to tell us all about this long arc of quackery. Dr. Joe, welcome. You have the con. Take it away, sir. Thank you very much for uh, uh, having me present to you guys here tonight. 
And uh, as uh, you heard, I do direct McGill University's Office for Science and Society, where we have a mandate to separate sense from nonsense. And as you can imagine, these days, that is quite a challenging endeavor. <clears throat> we try to shine the spotlight on all the snake oil salesmen out there and uh, replace the snake oil with sound science. But tonight I was asked to talk to you about uh, Quack Quack, my latest book, and some of the, what I think are interesting and entertaining contents. Well, quack, what does it mean? I think we all have a feeling for what a quack is all about. These are people who make claims, usually in the medical area, which are unsubstantiated, often just pure nonsense. Where does the word come from? That's sort of an interesting question. And there are many things that have been proposed. Uh, supposedly, it comes from an old Dutch word, quacksalver. And uh, these were people who sold magical salves on the street corner. Mostly, these things didn't work. And therefore, they started to call them quacks. <clears throat> Hard to know whether or not that is legitimate. But one thing I can tell you for sure that is legitimate is right now we are facing a wave of tsunami of quackery. And uh, they're threatening to engulf science. And we do have to take steps to, to fight back. This is the age not only of information, it is also the age of misinformation and disinformation. Now that is not necessarily new. I mean, we've heard of snake oil salesmen for a long time. In fact, the late 1800s was the era of snake oil. These were all kinds of, of uh, potions and lotions that were touted to be magical, but which really didn't work. And some of them were literally called snake oil. The idea here was that snakes never suffer from arthritis. They are soft and supple and curve all over the place. They're well lubricated on the inside. So the idea was that if we could isolate that natural snake oil, it would do a job on humans as well, take away arthritic pains. Well, snake oil was sold by uh, medicine men who traveled across the country. And these were the classic medicine shows. It was a collage of entertainment, some pseudoscience, a bit of real science, but uh, they certainly attracted an audience and they promoted all kinds of interesting commodities. They were supposed to cure whatever ailed you, whether you were human or whether you were an animal. And the covers the, uh, of these products were really quite amazing. Walcott's Instant Pain Annihilator, for example. Just look at the, the uh, graphics on this. Really, really neat. Well, this Instant Pain Annihilator may actually have done something because it contains some opium and some alcohol. The government started to get after these people because uh, you know they were making all kinds of false claims and nobody really knew what was in, in the product. And in 1906, in the US, uh, the Pure Food and Drug Act was passed, which uh, really made it illegal to sell these uh, snake oil remedies. So what were the snake oil salesmen to do if their market was taken away? Well, luckily for them, vitamins appeared on the scene. And these had some legitimate efficacy. For example, pellagra, which was epidemic in the Southern US. It was described as the disease of the four Ds, dermatitis, diarrhea, dementia, and death, mostly seen among poor people whose diet was uh, almost strictly corn, which contains no niacin, that is no, no B vitamin. And uh, that disease was in fact cured by supplements of vitamin D. It seemed magical. Vitamin C, was able to cure scurvy. Vitamin D cured rickets. So all of a sudden, there was a new commodity here that could be hyped to the public. And Louisiana Senator Dudley LeBlanc took up this challenge. He founded the Happy Day Company. And he started to market a product called Hadacol. 
Where did the name come from? Well, it came from hap for happy, da for day, ko for company, and then he added l to the end for Leblanc. So what was Harakal? <laughs> and when you know when he was asked what how he came up with this name, he actually didn't say what I, I just told you. Uh, he was kind of clever. He said, well, I just had to come up with something. But Harakal was a dietary supplement that was sold, and essentially it contained B vitamins and iron. But the reason that it did deliver some satisfaction to a lot of people was that it contained about 12% alcohol. The hype was glorious. It was to be good for arthritis, for asthma, for diabetes, epilepsy, all kinds of, of, of issues, very much like some of the supplements that are being touted today. But uh, LeBlanc introduced something that hadn't been seen for years, and that was the traveling medicine show. He called it the caravan show, the Hadakal traveling caravan. And this was a pretty big venture. They traveled through cities, they held parades, and he hired troops of entertainers, just like in the old medicine show days, to bring the crowds in. And these were well-known people at that time. If you look at this picture, you may recognize some of these entertainers. In the top row there, that's Minnie Pearl and Rudy Valley uh, in the bottom row. And they were top-notch names at the time. There were others. Mickey Rooney uh, was one of his prime features. Lucille Ball, Bob Hope, all starred in some of the Hadakal caravans. He even got George Burns and Gracie Allen to hype had a call. And they were, they were big promoters. And of course they did it by telling jokes. One of the good ones was toward by George. Have you heard about the 95 year old who was dying in the hospital? She was taking had a call. Didn't save her, did save the baby though. Kind of clever and you know funny in, in those days. And then there was also musical entertainment. There was the had a call boogie played by a country band. But the biggest hit of the Hadakal caravan was what put the pep in grandma, sung by Audrey Williams, who was the wife of uh, Hank Williams. And uh, it was a neat song. Grandma, 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 She's a cut and rust is that grandpa never seen. Grandpa short and droopy, grandma straight and tall. What put the pep in grandma? So they were, of course, singing about Hadakal. Dudley LeBlanc was a guest with Groucho Marx on his show. And this was pretty interesting and entertaining. Uh, Groucho asks him, and what is Hadakal good for? And Dudley had a great answer. It was good for five and a half million for me last year. And when he was asked, what does Hadakal do? He had another good answer. Hadakal is good for what ails you, as long as what ails you is what Hadakal is good for. Well, that was a uh, pretty neat quackery back then. But today, quackery has emerged into modern times, and our snake oil remedies look quite different, and the quacks have learned to cloak themselves in the garb of science. This is the reason that I kind of like ducks, and I collect them. I have about 300 different ducks, and people send me ducks uh, all the time, and I'm surrounded here in my office by these creatures, but there's a reason for that. I'm surrounded by them because I like to be constantly reminded of the need, need to fight quackery because it is everywhere around us. <clears throat> so I like my ducks, but I also have heroes. I have several. One you will recognize instantly just by the silhouette. That of course is Sherlock Holmes, the most famous uh, fictional detective in, in history. 
And the reason he's my hero is because of his dictum that it's a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. And we should all live by that creed. Houdini has also had a huge influence on me, both because of his escapes, his magic, but especially because of his battle with the spiritualists, including Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, curiously the creator of Sherlock Holmes, the most scientific detective in history. And then, of course, there is the amazing one, Randy. And I do a I owe a great deal to him. I followed his career ever since I, I can remember and I've learned a tremendous amount from him. But then there are my chemical heroes as well. William Henry Perkin, who in 1856 accidentally discovered mauve while he was searching for quinine and launched the era of synthetic organic chemistry. Uh, and I'm an organic chemist by background, so I certainly deal a great deal with that. Uh, I also owe a great deal to Michael Faraday, uh, one of the greatest scientists who ever uh, lived, uh, not only because of his scientific work, uh, but because Faraday also was the legendary father of the public lecture. He attracted huge crowds to the Royal Institute in London and entertained them with science. But not only that, he was also a great critical thinker, and he not only talked about the, the beauty of science, but about the importance of critical thinking. And he was already concerned at that time because of all the misinformation that people were getting. And he wrote a fascinating little booklet. And it's a, actually very hard to come by these days. It, it is a historic relic, but it is all about uh, mental education, as you can see by the title. And in it, he described some of the tricks that spiritualists were using in those days. This was the era in Victorian times when psychics, mediums, said that they could levitate tables, which they did, of course, by perfectly scientific means, but people were fooled by how they were doing this. And Faraday revealed this. So he was one of the original debunkers way, way before the amazing Randy. So we owe a great deal to, to Faraday. So I try to, to uh, I would say it's, it's, it's a little bit too much to say follow in their footsteps because those are way, way too big footsteps to follow in. But uh, from early on in my career, I thought it was important to describe science to people who were not scientists and to get them interested in, in science. And I've been doing that for, for a long time uh, with chemical demonstrations and, and uh, talks of of all kinds, hopefully with some modicum of, of success. And uh, a lot of this uh, also tied in very nicely with uh, uh, work in the media, both on television and on, on radio. And uh, I have a radio show uh, that has been now running for 43 years, which I think is the longest running radio show on chemistry in the history of the world although it is probably the only radio show on chemistry in the history of the world. So, you know, I can cherry pick data with the, the best of them. Uh, but it has been going on for a long time. <clears throat> of course, the only reason that you can tell it's been going on for a long time is because you see the dial telephone in the picture. So anyway, I, I uh, uh, field every Sunday afternoon, field questions from all over, talk about interesting scientific stories. And uh, I also get uh, tips on what is interesting to look into, both in the skeptical realm and in the scientific realm. For example, a couple of years ago, I had a call from someone asking me whether or not he should consult Mr. Coleman, who can heal just about everything. Well, it turned out that Mr. Coleman was coming to Montreal, so it turned out to be an interesting story. I quickly discovered who the gentleman was. A.F. Coleman was a bioenergetic healer. I read a little bit about his background. It was kind of fascinating. He talked about having been in the Israeli army. And uh, one morning, for some reason, he went up on a nearby mountain where he saw this giant contraption above the mountain. He passed out for a few minutes. And when he came Two, he felt like a different person. He felt that he had this energy that he could impart to others. And he came down from that mountain with the ability to heal. 
Q Moses. <laughs> this is what it reminded me of. Anyway, it turns out that Zev Coleman has uh, some people who backed him of evidence uh, that he suggested that he can do all of these wonderful things because Martin Sheen and Carly Simon, Raquel Welch believed in him. And uh, there were all kinds of others, Jill Nymark. And uh, so, you know, he had all of this evidence that I read about. And he was coming to Montreal. So I thought, you know, it would be interesting to find out really what is going on here. How does he heal? Because supposedly it was by just uh, maneuvering his hands above a person to fix their aura. Well, of course, that sounds kind of hokey, but, you know, I like to check these things out. So I sent my assistant at that time to make an appointment with him and just to see what it was about. And she came back and she described to me that, you know, she was made to uh, lie down on a, on a cot and uh, her complaint was to him was backache, which wasn't even true. But anyway, you know, he waves his hands around and uh, she comes back to me and she says to me, I felt it. I felt it. I say, what are you talking about? What did you feel? He says, I felt it. I felt the electricity. He wasn't touching me and I felt it. Now, this sounded kind of interesting. I didn't know what on earth this, this was. So the next thing to do was to consult. Who do you consult? Of course, you call up Randy. I did. I described to him what I had heard. And he said, well, there's something you should look at. Take a look at this magic apparatus called electric touch. So I did. I quickly ordered it from a magic store. And it turned out to be an interesting little device. This is what it looks like. And you strap it onto your leg. And then you cover it up, of course. And it basically allows you to generate static electricity. So I thought that this was very likely what he was doing. It's the same feeling as when you put your hand in front of a television set and you can feel the, the static. So I decided I had to check this out for myself. So I made an appointment and I go down there and I lie down on the couch. And indeed he starts to do the same thing. And I do feel it. I, I felt the hair standing up, you know, on, 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 on my arms. It definitely was elect it was static electricity, but I, I really couldn't confront him. I, you know, it wasn't the situation where I can say, let me see what's under your pants. But uh, I invited him to come down to McGill. And I said, look, uh, you know, uh, this is very interesting. Could we check this out uh, uh, further? So he, he said, uh, yes, I would happily do that. What would you like me to do? And then I did something I shouldn't have done. I said, well, you know, it would be simple. We'd actually do exactly what you do here, but we would, I think we'd ask you to do it without your shoes on. This was uh, the unfortunate that I said that because this gave him the clue that I knew what this was about. So although he had agreed to come down to McGill to be tested, of course, we never heard of him again, And uh, but he never did come back to Montreal. Uh, this device can allow you to pick up little pieces of paper. So it really does generate static electricity. I, I heard of Zef Coleman after uh, he was even healing people from an airplane. You don't even have to be close to him. He can even heal you over the telephone or when he's on the airplane, as you can see. And I now recently have learned that he has become Professor Zev Coleman. So this is sometimes, you know, I, I get to investigate these things uh, being tuned in from some of my callers. Uh, someone else told me about a, the zero point energy wand. Uh, this also supposedly cures every ailment that you have ever heard of. And here you can see what the, the claims are. And I went online and it cost $300, which I thought was a bit steep. But one day I saw it on sale for 75. And I thought, you know, that may be worth it. So I did plunk down the $75. I ordered it. And this thing comes. It looks like a, a piece of metal. It looks like a, a pen, except that it doesn't have the nib to write with. Like a, you know, a, a bald-headed pen is what it, it looks like. I don't know what to do with it. 
But I have a friend who's a dentist, so I asked him whether or not we could x-ray this just to see maybe there was some, something in it, maybe some device, maybe some radioactive substance, who knows? So we x-rayed it, and it is nothing but a solid piece of metal with a little bit of a crack in it. And yet you get anecdotes from people saying they've been cured of virtually everything by this magical little device. I was also tuned in by a caller to Alpha Spin. Cost me a hundred bucks, but listen, German technology, you gotta pay for that. So I buy this and I open the package. It kind of looks like a glass coaster that you would put under a cup. What is it supposed to do? Oh, it controls your quantum energy field. And you know, quantum is the great catchword these days. Everything quack is associated with, with, with uh, quantum. And again, you know, it improves circulation. Uh, it improves growth. I mean, anything that you want done, it can do. And uh, you turn this uh, little paper around and uh, you can learn that it is not radioactive. So I was happy to see that. It was tested for radioactivity. It's not. It was also tested to be alpha spin uh, or a, a food grade uh, alpha spin device. Although I did not have an urge to bite into this thing to test whether or not it was uh, edible. Uh, and then I found out that it actually isn't enough to buy one of these. You really have to buy four and you have to put them in the four corners of the room to make sure that the quantum energy field protects you and that you are not going to be exposed to any uh, hazardous electromagnetic radiation from any other kind of, of, of device. It also supposed to energize your food, your drink, etc. Although of course they have the usual disclaimer that it is not a medical device and that is not intended uh, as a substitute for professional medical opinion, and it's not intended to diagnose, treat, or prevent any disease. Yet, of course, that's exactly the claim that is made for it. And a bonus device came with it. It was the nano bioenergy card. Well, if you're not going to call something quantum, you call it nano, and you throw in bio, that makes it very marketable. What was this supposed to do? Well, improve vitality remove body odor, balance the energy field, helps recover from fatigue, improves the body microcirculation, and is effective at energizing the molecules in our drinking water. Miraculous product indeed. Well, sometimes I do feel a little bit uh, fatigued, lack vitality. So I thought, why not? Let me give it a try the way that they tell me to do this. So I did that. I did it on top, I did it on bottom, I did it sideways, backwards, every way that I was told. And uh, all I felt was disappointed. Didn't do anything for me. Neither did PMAT. And therein lies another interesting story. I was approached by two ladies who had just come back from Poland. And uh, they said that they had been to a talk in Poland where they heard about this wondrous product and they wanted to bring it to Canada because they thought that Canadians needed to be aware of the existence of this miracle. Now, they were not making any claims. They actually wanted my scientific opinion, whether or not this was legitimate. Because what they had been told was that PMAT was good for insomnia, for rheumatic pains, for headaches, muscle aches, fatigue, etc. And they brought me this book a whole book, a thick book of explanation on how this thing worked. And as you can see from all the terms here, uh, they have uh, geometric configuration. They have all, all kinds of interesting, you know, neo-energy uh, terms that really don't mean anything, but may sound legitimate to someone who doesn't have a scientific background. <clears throat> well, what was this miracle material? What was PMAT? Well, let me show you a real picture of PMAT. Here it is. It was a little rag. It's about eight inches square. And the miraculous part of this, supposedly, are the red dots 
which are on there in a specific geometric pattern to attract the quantum energy of the universe. What do you do with it? You put it under your sheet when you're sleeping at night. Well, I thought this was pretty interesting and it merited a little bit of, a, of exploration. So I suggested a study to these two ladies. Uh, I do a, a monthly lecture series here in, in Montreal to uh, a group of, of seniors. And I get, you know, 100, 150 of them coming every week. And these obviously are, are people who do have arthritic pains of all kinds, sleep problems. And I suggested that we do a study with these people, that we tell them to sleep on the PMAT, but we do it in a proper double blind fashion. That is, we put the PMAT into a cotton envelope and we also get the same material without the red dots on it, put that into an envelope too, all of it coded. And believe it or not, the company, the, the Polish company who sells PMAT agreed to do that for us, to make the envelopes, put the codes, everything. So we organized this and uh, we handed out questionnaires to these people. And all they were told is that we were asking them to sleep on this thing for two weeks. But before they do that, for two weeks, they were asked to fill out questionnaires about their sleeping habits, aches and pains, etc. After the two week period, they were given either the active or the inactive PMAT, and they slept on that for four weeks. After that, we switched. They slept on the other version for four weeks, and they filled out all these questionnaires. And then we analyzed the questions. And as you might expect, there was no difference between the PMAT and the placebo PMAT. It was, of course, placebo versus placebo. There was absolutely no difference whether the red dots were on there or not. But there was a dramatic difference between the first two weeks when they were not, they were just sleeping in their bed, but just filling out the question this every morning and the next eight weeks. Because of course they knew that some experiments was on the way and that we were trying to test something in the health area. So of course the placebo effect kicked in. Well, when, when we went over the data with the two ladies, they recognized that this really was not a legitimate uh, product and they decided not to sell it but it is still being sold. In fact, you can buy it on, uh, on Amazon. Uh, there it is, the PMAT Energy Regenerator rebalances and restores your energy field, your aura. So if any of you feel that your aura is deficient these days, or there are holes that have been punched in your aura by some form of electromagnetic radiation, you can give the PMAT a try. Something else that uh, was brought to my attention is Jingwei were the ear candles. This actually was at a conference I went to. Uh, it was a health conference where you see a lot of unhealthy things. It was one of these alternative health conferences. And there was a, a booth there where they were selling ear candles. These are these hollow wax candles uh, with all kinds of claims about how it is supposed to work. You light one end, of course, you light the end remote from the ear, and that supposedly heats up the air inside, which then rises, creates a vacuum, and sucks out all of the toxins from your body, which are embedded in the earwax. So they have this scientific sounding lingo with this. So I was listening to this, obviously very skeptical, but I decided, okay, let's do a little experiment here. So I plunked down my 25 bucks. I got two uh, candles for this and um, lay down on the demonstration table right there in the middle of the exhibit hall. And I was uh, outfitted with the candle that I held in my ear. And the uh, therapist lit the candle, it burned all the way down. And then to demonstrate how well this worked, she took the candle, the end, the residue that was left, this is what it looked like. It is aluminum at the bottom to, to make sure that your ear doesn't get too hot. Cut it open. And she said, look, there is the earwax that was sucked out of the ear. And in there are all of the toxins. <clears throat> well, of course, I knew that there was no earwax sucked out of my ear with this. I knew that the, the idea of that this creates a vacuum is, is nonsense. You couldn't even pick up a piece of, of uh, Kleenex tissue with, with, with it. 
But uh, I decided that this was worth a demonstration. There were about a dozen people who were standing around watching. So I took my other candle and I held it in my hand without an ear attached. I lit it and let it burn down and cut it open at the bottom and showed exactly the same thing. How many people you think got out of line? Even after I explained that this is just the wax from the candle that dripped down on the inside and solidified at the bottom. How many got out of line? One. The others, I don't know what they believed. Maybe that this device was so miraculous that it could remove earwax in some sort of a remote fashion, Wi-Fi for ear, earwax. And it just makes you sad that some of this is happening out there and that people are taken in. But what really makes me sad is when chemistry is misplayed. Like this guy, Shane Ellison, who's the people's chemist, as he calls himself. He has a bachelor's degree in biology, a master's degree in organic chemistry. That's true. He really has that. He abandoned a career, he says, as a pharmaceutical chemist because he saw the light how the pharmaceutical industry was, was basically making a fool of pe people with their chemicals. So he launched his chemical-free lifestyle experience. Here's a former chemist talking about chemical-free. Now, how nonsensical is that? Uh, everything in the world, of course, is made of chemicals, except for a vacuum, and you wouldn't be happy living in a vacuum. Uh, look at his advice. You don't have to worry about blood pressure anymore. You don't have to take your thyroid pills or your antidepressants. Uh, cholesterol problems, forget it. No more insulin for you diabetics. This is what he promises. And as you might expect, he's also quite an anti-vaxxer. He thinks that COVID-19 was just a, a fraud and that big pharma is fooling us with all the vaccines. And he turns people away from vaccination with a time-honored way of using the complex chemical terms to frighten people. So he shows people all of the ingredients in the vaccine, and of course they have tongue-twisting chemical names. People are frightened. And then he sells them his chemical-free products, like sarsaparilla blend testosterone primer. The fact is that sterols and sarsaparilla are not anabolic steroids. They don't get converted to testosterone in, in, in the body. He sells pre-workout products, faster, higher, stronger in 59 minutes without chemicals. Not 58 minutes, not 60 minutes, 59 minutes. Well, what is in there? Well, there's some citrulline, some tyrosine, Hawthorne extract, yerba mate, and huperzine, which I suppose are not chemicals. So what on earth are they? This is total nonsense, but this guy is making a fortune from selling nonsensical products and hyping them to the uh, credulous public. <clears throat> that is also what Anthony William, the medical medium is doing, but he doesn't even claim to have any scientific education at all. And of course you don't need any scientific education these days to sell books. His book, The Medical Medium, has been on the New York Times bestseller list. He's got a radio show in Florida where he answers medical questions. How does he get around not being labeled as practicing medicine without a license? Because the information doesn't come from him. It comes from a spirit. He has a spirit contact out there in the ether, a former physician who has the answers to everything. And he just is sort of the interface between the spirit physician and the caller. So it is that spirit who answers all of the questions. And almost all the time, the questions are answered in one way. Drink celery juice. That is the, this is the miraculous healing product. Now, there's nothing wrong with drinking celery juice. Not very good tasting but it's certainly not going to solve problems. But he is there making lots of money, selling absolute nonsense. But at least it's kind of benign stuff. You know, you tell people to drink celery juice, that's not 
not dangerous. But the cure for cancers, that puts us into a totally different category. This book was written by Hulda Clark. She was one of my arch enemies, debated her a couple of times. Her uh, claim was that uh, every disease, and especially cancer, was caused by a parasite in our body. She was particularly troublesome to me because she had spent two years at McGill before going on to get a degree in, in uh, Minnesota. And uh, that bothered me, that, that she was educated at McGill and claiming that all diseases were caused by this parasite and you could drive the parasite out of our body by just eating cloves, uh, black walnut tincture and wormwood extract. And she was telling people how to make a device from parts that you could buy at Radio Shack that would tell you whether or not you had this parasite in you. And if it gave you a positive reading, then you could just adjust the machine to kill the parasite and cure you of cancer. And then later she came out with a book, The Cure for All Diseases, not only cancer. And this was followed by The Cure for HIV and AIDS, which apparently was not a disease that was covered in The Cure for All Diseases. The law got after her. She was driven out of the US. She set up shop in, in Mexico and she practiced her malarkey there. When she was struck by disease, she did come back to the US for treatment. Uh, and uh, the treatment was not wormwood. It was not black walnut tincture. She did get some treatment, but nevertheless, she did die. What did she die of? Uh, multiple myeloma is a type of cancer. The doctor could not cure herself. But she's still around in spirit because Dr. Clark's store is still around selling the same bunk and again claiming to cure cancer and selling the instrument that does so. The Dr. Clark Zapper for $367 plus tax, but it will cure you of cancer, so they claim. Well, actually they say it may cure you of cancer because those are the kind of weasel words that they use to get out of legal uh, prosecution. But what people are really buying here is magic. That's what they're buying. I do like magic, <clears throat> stage magic. Uh, I've been practicing that for a long time. Uh, at first pulling live rabbits out of hats, but that was pretty difficult because you had to keep the bunnies in between performances. So that I did switch to the synthetic rabbits. And uh, I fused the uh, stage magic together with chemical magic, but always making sure that people knew what is magic and what is science. And that magicians on the stage are only actors playing the role of a magician. And everything that they do is done by perfectly explicable scientific means. So you can imagine, because of my fondness for magic and for science, that in the 1970s, when I first heard of Uri Geller, the Israeli mentalist who was able to bend spoons by the power of his mind, so he said, I got very interested. And when he came to Montreal, I think it was 1974, I went to see him. There was a large crowd at the ballroom where he performed, and he bent spoons, he bent keys. It was pretty interesting. So I started to follow his career, especially once Randy wrote the book about the truth about Uri Geller, explaining, of course, how he did everything and was all done by perfect, explicable magic means and sleight of hand, and that, you know, he was just a clever magician, but of course, he would not admit to that. And then Uri wrote a book called Mind Medicine. And by this time, I was doing my radio show, and I thought he would be a great guest. He was in England at the time, but he agreed to come on by uh, telephone. He didn't know anything about me, of course. And uh, I introduced him, I think, very nicely uh, because I had, in fact, first heard about him from my uncle who had lived in Israel and who had gone to see him when he was a nightclub entertainer very early in his career. When he was doing a trick whereby uh, he'd have a, a, an audience volunteer hold a piece of something in their hand and it would get all hot. And he said it was because of his mind power. And I knew it was done by a, a chemical trick. 
In any case, so I, I introduced Yuri and I said, you know, I first heard about you when, when you were doing this uh, interesting chemical stunt in a nightclub in Israel. And he said, what are you talking about? I never performed anything like that. I never entertained a nightclub. Slam, you slammed down on me. And that was my first experience with, with Uri, but I followed his career ever since. And just uh, this past year, this past uh, uh, November, I was in Israel and I had learned that Uri had opened a museum, the Uri Geller Museum in Jaffa near Tel Aviv. And we arranged for a visit. The museum is only open to special guests. You have to have a group. And we did have a group with my uh, three daughters and some of my grandchildren. And we had a group of about 12 and uh, we, we paid. It was not un, un, unreasonable. Uh, uh, it was, uh, I, I think, uh, $500 for uh, 12 people to have a, a tour with Uri himself. And I thought this, I can't pass this up. So we arranged to go there and we go there. In front of the museum is a giant spoon a multi-ton metal spoon, uh, bent, obviously. It's a great sculpture. And inside the museum, I can tell you, is fantastic. It really is. He has collected artifacts from all over the world, <laughs> uh, astronaut suits that had actually been worn on, on, on the moon. Uh, he he knows people all over the world, prime ministers, presidents. I mean, he really has gotten around. It's amazing what a little spoon bending trick will do. The yellow uh, Volkswagen there is the first car he ever had. He managed to somehow find it uh, again. He has really remarkable stuff in the museum, including this Cadillac, which is adorned with hundreds and hundreds of bent spoons. Well, of course, as you can imagine, I had gone there you know, with kind of a chip on my shoulder because, you know, I, I, I wasn't very fond of what Yuri had done during his career. Let me tell you, <laughs> surprisingly, the man was absolutely charming. He really was. He uh, gave us a guided tour of the museum. It was about two hours long. He told fantastic stories. He talked about the people he had met. He showed pictures of all, all, all the people. It was really absolutely fascinating. And he really stayed away from, from the, the hokey stuff. Although he did sometimes refer to it, uh, but he kind of insinuated, well, you know, you guys know, you know, that I bent spoons. That's how I made my fame and all of that. And he just kind of suggested that this, this was well known and that, you know, he had this power, et cetera, but that's not what we were there for. We we're there for all the artifacts in the museum. And we got talking and uh, when he found out that I had a Hungarian background, which he has also, and we started chatting in Hungarian, he became very, very friendly. He wanted to make a movie of me, which he, he, he did. And uh, so uh, he really was not, certainly in this instance, not the fraud artist that, uh, you know, that I thought he would, would be. Um, he has had an amazing career. I mean, when, when you know, I, I said that I know quite a lot about magic and skepticism, uh, you know, we didn't really get into it, but, but it was kind of like, you know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about, but we can't openly talk about it. It was, it was kind of, of like that. At the end of this whole visit, he did bend a spoon. And uh, it was pretty good. He did it very well. And I have the spoon, he signed it. And uh, so this is one of the artifacts that I have in my little museum here in, in my office. And he gave this to me and in parting, he said, uh, hang on to this. Uh, it's gonna be worth a lot more when I die. <laughs> so uh, I will certainly hang on to it, but uh, it, it was really quite an interesting artifact to collect. Uh, I wasn't going to challenge him for evidence, which I do to so many other people, because it just wasn't the right situation. He was friendly and amicable. I, I wasn't going to, to confront. But there are others who I'm very willing to confront. If I ever meet Joe Mercola, I certainly will do that. As you know, he's been labeled the most influential spreader of, of misinformation online by the New York Times. Every day, this man who has millions of followers comes out with nonsense that seems to supersede the nonsense that he came out with the day before. Uh, 
Uh, he's a dedicated anti-vaxxer, dedicated conspiracy theorist, dedicated seller of hokey products from which he has made a fortune. He lives in a $4 million mansion. The FDA has warned him repeatedly selling bogus products. He pays a fine and that's it. He makes so much money. Some of his arguments are incredible. If you remember the Will Smith slap, he claims this was all choreographed. Why? <laughs> because his wife uh, suffers from, uh, Will Smith's wife suffers from uh, alopecia areata, and uh, a company was going to come out with uh, a product uh, to treat this problem, and they were also the sponsors of the awards, and that this was all therefore put together to bring publicity to her loss of hair and how uh, this was going to be uh, cured. He comes up the with the most unbelievable things uh, that um, the vaccine, of course, is, is dangerous and it is going to cause a new disease that he has invented, uh, which he calls vaccine acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. So I don't know how many people he has been able to convince of this, but there are certainly people who have had severe health problems and possibly even died because of the advice that he's giving. So to me, Joe Mercola is really the, the devil incarnate. So as you can see uh, from my experiences, uh, there is a tremendous need to separate sense from nonsense. We need to do more of it. We need to have a lot of people playing this, uh, this game. So I hope I've been able to inform you and entertain you uh, a little bit here uh, tonight. And, opened some eyes to some of the stuff that is going out there. And I suspect that there might be some burning questions that arise, uh, which certainly I'd be happy to deal with. And uh, if you uh, want to follow us, we do have a website and we have a, a free weekly newsletter that we produce. And uh, all you have to do is go to the website and sign up uh, there and it will be delivered to you 5 a.m. every Saturday morning with a, a bunch of interesting and, and um, uh, entertaining stories, some of which are historical, some of which are current. I mean, obviously, when something happens like the Ohio train disaster, we deal with that. And uh, we, we try to make it uh, informative and uh, entertaining at the same time. So thanks very much for... Uh, listening to me uh, drone on here for about 45 minutes. And uh, if there are any questions or comments, certainly be very happy to uh, entertain them. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Dr. Joe. And uh, I will tell you, yes, uh, there are burning questions. We have people who are, are uh, clamoring. I do want, I want to give a quick shout out to the office uh, of uh and now it's, now it's just leaving my it's leaving my mind. You're uh, the office of science and society. Science society. Oh my gosh! Like such a valuable resource. Uh, we look to it all the time. There's so much good stuff coming out of there. If you're interested in this area of inquiry, like go check that that entire thing out. There's a lot of smart people doing a lot of good work there. So I definitely endorse that. And speaking of which, um, for people who have the most burning question, uh, uh, Rob Eisen was asked this in the chat earlier. Where do we where do we listen to your show, Joe? Where do we listen to to the Doctor Joe show? Yes, you can you can actually listen anywhere in the world. It's uh, three o'clock Sunday afternoon Eastern time, and uh, the show is on radio station CJAD in Montreal. So all you have to do is into the Google line, put CJAD.com, and it will come right up, and you can listen. But also, you can go to our website. And all of the previous shows are, are there as podcasts. There you go. So you there can you listen to all Lives of them. Lives forever. There we go. Excellent. Good. So people who have not yet had enough Dr. Joe, they can get uh, much more. So we, we have a lot of really good questions here, and we don't have a ton of time. So I'm going to truncate some of them because some of them are asking sort of a, a similar things. Um, Reinhold Schlieper asked in there, how does one rule out the placebo effect if a person is easily influenced? They might experience improvements. Uh, it might be, he says, it might be traceable to mental adjustments. 
and that made me also think of something you wrote in your book as well, which how you looked as what, what, how do you determine what is pseudoscience right. in general? And you talked about it as relating to the old, like, how do I know what obscenity is? Well, I know what's obscene. I know it when I look at it. Is the placebo effect sort of like that, where it's like, well, there, the placebo like a... effect is very real, and it's not right. something we want to sweep under the carpet. Mm -hmm. Because if someone says they feel better, <laughs> their perception is that they feel better, right? right? The the problem with the placebo effect is that people may resort to something that provides the placebo effect when there are legitimate treatments available for whatever condition they are suffering from. I don't have any qualms about people trying whatever they think merits treatment after they have excluded conventional care and found that they've done everything in that area, by all means, go for everything. Go for the ultimate absurdity, which is homeopathy, okay? I, I don't blame them because the placebo effect can kick in about 30, 40% of the time. It of course does not change the underlying disease. It just changes their perception of the disease. It does not have any physiological effect. But perception can be very important. I mean, if you feel less pain, you're feeling less pain, right? So I, I really don't uh, bark against the uh, placebo effect. Uh, you just want to make sure that you're on the right track and that you're not missing some proper conventional uh, therapy. I think that's what a lot of people, I, I know a lot of people have said to me that like, well, X product we know doesn't work. Oh, but what about the placebo effect? And I think that distinction is so key that it doesn't actually affect the underlying condition. It's yeah. your perception of it. I think a lot of folks miss that that nuance. The, the power of suggestion is, is, is very potent. And the connection between the body and the mind is, is very real. I mean, just think about it. You know, you're lying in bed at night, in the middle of the night, and the telephone rings. Well, all of a sudden, your heart starts to race, right? And you start to sweat because you know this is probably not someone calling you that you won the lottery. Uh, and nobody has touched you. Nothing has happened. So, you know, something made your heart speed up and something made you sweat. It's coming from the mind. So the mind can do all kinds of things to the body, but it will not cure cancer. <laughs> We got a lot of questions on a very similar theme, so I'm going to try to get to some of it. Uh, Paul Cena asked about uh, the product Airborne, which is marketed for uh, preventing yes. colds and flus. Uh, Jay Clifton mentioned Nareva, a product that allegedly helps to improve your memory. It's endorsed by Mayim right. Bialik, who hosts Jeopardy yes. and has a PhD in neuroscience. And and so Peter Roloff asked this question, and I think it it's all kind of yes, rounds I, up yeah, into yeah. these. Uh, like what do you, how does a consumer know when they're seeing these commercials on TV, when yeah. they're in the aisle at CVS or Rite Aid or something, and they see these products right alongside all the other things that are proven to work? Uh, how how do they know what what to walk away from and what to be skeptical of and what can they do about it? Well, of course, the correct answer is to go to our website. Mm, good call. So we good have call. all these answers. <laughs> okay. But uh uh, save that. Uh, well, let, Mayim Bialik, I like Mayim. I, I, I like her. Uh, I think she's very good uh, as a host on, uh, on Jeopardy. Good, yeah. I, I loved her on, in Big Bang. And she really does have a degree in neuroscience, although she never did anything with it. Uh, she never practiced as a, you know, so it's calling herself a neuroscientist is a, a bit of, of, a, of a stretch. But she's playing up on her celebrity status and she's hyping this thing for which there's no evidence. Uh, and there are many of these, these supposed smart pills that are supposed to improve your memory or, you know, whatever. Uh, and, you know, you, all you have to do is watch TV at night, especially, you know, if you watch uh, uh, the news at, at night, you get all of these commercials. Well, some, of course, are for legitimate uh, prescription products, but you get uh, uh, a lot of, of these mental things, none of which have any scientific evidence. 
uh, and they use all the weasel words, you know, it may help or it may support, uh, etc. Airborne does exactly the same thing. I mean, if you want to look at an interesting story, look at the history of Airborne. It was invented by an elementary school teacher. Uh, it is total nonsense. That was the but selling it's point. It's a fascinating story of what you can do with nonsense if you have the right hype and the right advertising. There is no scientific evidence that airborne works. I mean, it, it just doesn't do anything for the common cold. Uh, of course, neither is there any good evidence that vitamin C works for the common cold, which was pushed by one of the top scientists in the world last century, Linus Pauling. So even Nobel Prize winning uh, chemists can go astray. That's actually a really good point because one question, one theme of questions that came up is why do these legitimate scientists, you mentioned the the chemist who now wants us to all live a chemistry free life. What what is what is making them go astray like this? Is it just about the money and celebrity? Do you think? Like I think so. I, yeah. I I think they they find the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and um, it's disappointing. You know, though, there right? there is money to be made. It's very hard to think that some legitimate scientists are like someone who really was trained in chemistry with a master's right. in organic chemistry to come out with the phrase of a chemical free life. I mean, you know, either he has gone totally batty, uh, you know, lost his mind, or he just found the niche to, to, make, yeah. to make money. Yeah, and and there are others like that. You know, Dr. Gundry is another one who was a legitimate cardiac uh, surgeon and now he came out with this scheme that every ailment is due to lectins in our diet. And that if we just uh, eliminate lectins in, in our diet, everything is going to be fine. Well, I and know there, a lectin there, if I see it. Like where, where do, I don't even know where beans, to find these things. Beans, for example. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, if you eliminate beans, you will eliminate gas. This is true. But you will not cure any um, underlying disease. So there are many legitimate scientists who, you know, who have so kind of crossed over to the dark side. And uh, I mean, we can in that same breath mention Dr. Oz, who obviously, obviously was a talented cardiac surgeon. And uh, then Oprah anointed him God, gave him his own show. And now you got to fill five hours every week of network television. You got to tell people more than to exercise and eat broccoli. So all of a sudden, there's the green coffee bean extract and the raspberry ketone uh, that is going to miraculously slim you down. You know? So why did he do it? Uh, fame, right? And also really the need to cater to the audience because television has to sell itself. So they know who their audience was, you know, middle-aged women who are very often concerned about weight. So that's why you had all of the miraculous weight loss products on the Dr. Uh, Dr. Oz show. So anyway, I, I was... Uh, uh, I was not disappointed that he lost the nomination for yeah. Senate. Right, right. Yeah. yeah that, you know, and I, I want folks to read the book because there's this whole bit you have about, uh, what is he called? Um, the uh, It's the guy who would help out the first person at the medicine shows. Oh, the Mary Andrew, the, the person who played the Mary Andrew, the sidekick hype man, the the jester for the mountebanks. Right. Um, and th that really made me think of folks like, Dr. Oz and other folks who enable uh, these other uh, sorts of, you know, charlatans to come on their shows and they sort of serve as these hype men. Uh, they're, they're the Mary Andrews of today. And if we had more time, I'd love for you to tell that story. But folks just have to buy the book and, and learn more about that. Uh, we'll just add one more thing before we go. Uh, someone named Debbie Schwartz has chimed in to say that this, there's a, not a question, but a comment that Dr. Joe's grandsons are watching and are budding <laughs> scientists destined to follow in their granddad's footsteps. You said you had that you were not following that you were barely following in footsteps. I think that you are forging a path here, Doctor Joe. Um, well, I and, tell you that yeah. if my grandsons watch this, then it was worth doing this uh, this lecture. That's really lovely. That was really good. I, okay, that's good. So we we had a good you know several hundred people and your grandkids, which is excellent. <laughs> yes. Um, so that's really all we have time for today. So uh, just on behalf of the Center for Inquiry and everybody uh, watching, thank you so much, Dr. Joe, for your time tonight. And please, folks, go and check out the book, Quack Quack. It really is a lot of fun. And I really do think you're going to enjoy it, even in the, 
and long in the supermarket. Um, and uh, and Dr. Joe, so Dr. Joe, thank you. And everybody at home, thank you for watching. Uh, this episode should be posted probably tomorrow at some point at centerforinquiry.org. And good night, everyone.